Welcome to Pro Audio Profiles. I'm Brennan DeCora, and on this show, we focus on techniques for inspired studio performances. Each week, I host experts from across the industry. Let's get started. Today, we have Matt Hyde. He's a producer and engineer that's worked with Porno for Pyros, Monster Magnet, Slayer, Deftones, Seether, and many more. Enjoy. First and foremost, I want to thank you for, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. Awesome. It's awesome. Awesome. Um, I'd like to start, if you could kind of go over your backstory, kind of how, oh how you okay. got to where you are. <laughs> <laughs> this is the... Uh, okay, so... Uh, just you know, was a was a you know was a musician in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, decided to go to music school. Went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, okay, and uh, wasn't very good at it. Wasn't good compared to all the people there. But you know, <laughs> but but it was cool. Like I had a, I did a, you know, I, I came in thinking. Um, that I wanted to do. They had just started their music production and engineering program. This okay. is way back in like uh, like 1982. It hadn't been going okay. that long. Nice. Um, and my thought process going in there was like, well, you know, I'm never going to be like such a great musician or, you know, maybe I'll, uh, uh, you know, become an engineer or, just, or, you know, work behind the scenes. Right. Um, the cool thing was is, you know, uh, I played in a bunch of bands. I wasn't that bad or anything, but like the cool thing was, is I had learned, uh, you know, music theory and reading before mm -hmm. I got there. So I okay. tested out of a lot of stuff right. and I was kind of doing this thing of like, I was doing like jazz comp and arranging and, Dang. and, um, music production and engineering. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it, I was probably there about two years and I got a job as an intern at a local recording studio. Okay. And I also got into a band that was like a shitty top 40 cover band. I shouldn't okay. be swearing, right? I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, all right. <laughs> totally um, explicit. It's fine. A bad uh, <laughs> top 40 cover band, and we, but that we that we would tour. And the, but the guy had a contract with the Pentagon, and we tour around the world wow. and do these DOD things. Jeez. So I was I was <laughs> dropping out of school for semesters to do these these tours around the world right. with this band, and also I had this gig at this uh, recording studio, and pretty quickly into it, it was like. Within a few weeks of emptying waste baskets and right. breaking down sessions, one day the guy had like ended the owner of the studio had indigestion and just left me there with like oh, the client to finish like a vocal. <laughs> and when I came back the next day, it was like client liked you. You're gonna do him from now on. And he just started okay. giving me his clients that he didn't really want to work with, right, crappy right. stuff. And and I just you know ruined a bunch of people's uh, music for. <laughs> A few years and right. learned a bunch of nice. stuff. But one of the really cool things is I had the keys to the studio and he let me work there. And one of the things I did a lot of early on were these, I would do rock bands and bands mm -hmm. from my school there. And I would do live to two track, like okay. live to quarter nice. inch. So you yeah, yeah. set everything up, dial in all the sounds, get right. the mix and boom, and you're out of there. You know, this is record nice. overnight. And so it provided me with an opportunity to work on the whole thing like signal flow nice. gain staging That's mixing cool. tracking all at once and right. tracking the effects and doing everything all right. at once and trying to <laughs> do it and i ruined a bunch of those and yeah. then a couple of them <laughs> came out good and made right. some friends and started getting some other production gigs and then pretty soon i was like you know producing local bands there and pretty soon i was producing bands where i noticed on the tape box that my teacher's names were, were right, the previous right, people and then i was right. like you know i think i'll just do this and they dropped out of school <laughs> and i kept doing that for a while and then about um a year or so around a year or so later one of the guys that i'd uh, met through recording there i began writing songs with and he was going out to la he'd gotten some kind of publishing deal and mm. he dragged me out here okay. and so i ended up here in la and that was in about 1986 i think okay 86 87 mm -hmm. and couldn't get a gig out here to save my life you know like in, yeah. in music just bumming around playing in his band doing different stuff right um and then um i was working at a this place called reggie stereo on uh santa monica boulevard okay. and uh the guy and, and uh it wasn't Mike or Adam, but the, the, their other partner. I can't. Oh, Nick. Do you ever? You probably don't, don't even know. No, him. See, he was already Nick. out of the picture. Yeah. This is a Paramount. Well, right. uh, he. We both worked at the same studio way back. Yeah, so. Yeah. so, 
Nick came in to buy something, gave me his card. I went there. Uh, they hired me. Mm. I met the chief engineer, who was this guy, Larry Getz, who was a really, really cool guy. Okay. And uh, he liked me. And I started working a lot at that studio. It was Paramount uh, Recording. Mm -hmm. And then he brought me over to work with this band, uh, War. Uh, they right. were working on a record. This was like 1980. Eight or eighty nine. Mm -hmm. The record took like two years. I met this guy Jerry Jeez. Goldstein, who was a producer, and he had me working with uh, Sly Stone. Nice. Was, and I was and my main background at this point, I was doing a lot of um, programming, like MIDI programming. Right, MIDI right. was like the big wow. thing, and right, I could, right. I, as I was telling you uh, before, like my superpower was I I knew how to use Performer on a little crappy Mac computer yeah. with a screen like that big, <laughs> yeah. and I could stripe the <laughs> tape with time code and, and yeah. print everybody's MIDI tracks and record their vocals. This is how I was right, get, got right. the gigs at Paramount. Huh. And then they uh, War kind of hired me to do the same thing and nice. um, Sly and all these guys because MIDI was really big at the time. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was this is like bef just before digital audio. Right, right. And um, so hmm. I worked with, on some of those things and started working on other projects. And one of the projects that came through was this guy, Muggs, from this band 7A3. And he was putting together mm -hmm. this group, Cypress Hill. So okay. I did, I did. I was in the studio with Cypress Hill the very first time they were ever nice. together. And we did all their demos okay. that led up to the record. Right, they right. did the record with this guy, Joe Nicolo, who later on, really, really cool guy. Uh, the, they're called the Butcher Brothers out mm -hmm. of um, Philly. And oddly enough, were managed by my first manager later on when I when I okay. finally got yeah. to that phase. So, um, but that was before that. So I did a bunch of projects with Mugs. I started getting really involved in rap and stuff like yeah. that. Nice. And then from the rap thing, um, I was doing all these different bands. I mean, it was this was L.A. rap scene, like early uh, late '80s, early uh, '90s, right. and like I had a chance to do all these guys like you know Ice T and. King nice. T and Kid Frost, all these guys probably you don't even know these guys now, but yeah. they're. Uh, and I also did this this really cool. Uh, this one I actually engineered. I, I got this. I hooked up with this A and R uh, person named Kim Bowie from Island, and she was mm. giving me these these Island Records uh, rap right. sessions as right. an engineer. And the other thing, the other angle that I had at that time, the two angles were the MIDI angle earlier, and then the mm. next angle was a, that I had a lot of tracking experience that went back to that time. In Boston, right, right, and, the, and a lot of these rap groups wanted to, you know, they were, the samples were starting to get expensive and licensing, so right. they want, they needed somebody who could actually record stuff, right. and I would record live bands and loops and stuff from yeah. that way. So I had a little nice. bit of better engineering experience. So these are just like little skill angles that kind of yeah. got me in the door <laughs> with these these type of nice. things. Then, a uh, well, long story short, the the same guy, the guy that was on that session with Muggs was this kid, Skate Master Tate, who was this really cool guy who had a crazy record collection. So all the, uh, you know, the rap producers loved him. So he had this right. massive record collection for samples. Nice. And we were really good friends and just hang out and smoke weed and do all kinds of stuff. And he <laughs> right. he kind of tapped me to do his projects. He had a he had a um, a. a, a he had a couple different things. He had an MTV show, and he also had a, a deal on Beware. And his, he was really locked uh, uh, locked into the whole skateboarding thing. Like right, he knew right. all the pro skaters and nice. shit like that. Awesome. And through that, he got a gig as a DJ on the first Lollapalooza, and he, he knew Perry. He just knew all those guys from the West Side, so he knew Perry right. Farrell. And Perry's uh, was just winding down Jane's addiction, and he introduced me. Uh, somehow, we were at this outside a club in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and he ran into Perry and introduced me to him. And they they wanted to do some demos, so I took him to the studio. It was the same studio where I did War and all these things. I had the right. keys to studio. It was a really cool, amazing studio that I ended up taking over later on on Vine Street, uh, right around the corner from Paramount, okay. call, uh, called uh, Crystal. And okay. it's where Stevie Wonder did songs in the key of life oh, and wow. Inner Visions and huh. uh, just all these great 70 records, 70s records were done there, Super Tramp. Right. All, th all this, like, s that 78, 79 yeah. era stuff. <laughs> nice, Really nice. awful, but no, I, I mean, it's really good sounding stuff, amazing right. sounding stuff. Actually, really good stuff, I shouldn't say awful. But, no. <laughs> um, oh, good. Uh, so I brought Perry over there in the middle of the night, and uh, they did some demos, mm -hmm. and it was kind of a gnarly session. Won't get into the <laughs> details That's of cool. it, but it was kind of like, oh, God. I mean, I'd always loved Jane's Addiction, and I'd always thought you know Perry was amazing. Right. But at the time, the weird thing for me is at the time, I was so enmeshed in the, not in the rock world anymore. I, mm -hmm. I came up playing 
uh, guitar and my all my heroes were like right. 60s and 70s rock bands and stuff but yeah. somehow I'd moved into this early th this rap era like kind of like the west coast early west coast rap and like you know uh, public enemy that uh, the bomb right. squad stuff like that was the stuff that was really interesting me just like mm. looping samples and doing all kinds of right, mad right. scientist midi <laughs> drum machine yeah. sampling stuff um but uh perry really liked working with me really and 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 afterwards um i wasn't into it at all uh, but but tate was saying like oh he really wants to meet you he really wants to uh, mm. work with you again and, and um and i was just did i didn't I, I just didn't comprehend how big he was or what you right, know, was right. going to happen with that. But he was a really cool guy. I liked yeah. him. He was really, it was fun. Mm -hmm. It was a little crazy. Um, <laughs> but I was crazy too, so it didn't yeah. matter or whatever. <laughs> okay. But, okay. but um, uh, what happens next is I go over to Tate's house to get some weed and, and he's there and I kind of get cornered. And he's like, you know, I really want to do another you know session at that studio I, you know, yeah. and he's like you know i can get you anything you want if you want to do this and i'm nice. like sure let's let's do it you know like i i, I kind of didn't want to do it but i was like kind of cornered <laughs> right, there right. and i saw i i set up a session that day and then this time man like semis pull up and this time it's what? the real serious stuff in perkins and uh <laughs> and um he has his band perkins right, right. and and martin yeah, yeah and it's amazing and we do three songs that night and two of those songs end up on the first porno for pyro's record nice. just as they were tracked that night right. because uh <laughs> He turned to me in the middle of that that, that night and said, "I want you to produce my record," nice. and it was crazy. And it, because he, the, stu, the stu, it wasn't me, by the way. It's just the studio was a magical right, right. studio. Makes, they had these the incredible easy. vibes. <laughs> Everybody loved to work there. That's why I ended up. I, I got lucky and I was actually able to lease it and take it over. Oh, nice! So that was the beginning for me. That like okay. uh, because I all of a sudden once. I was doing that. Everybody was like, "Who's this guy that's working with Perry?" You know, right, he had right. just. This is his new project after Jane's Addiction. Alternative right, rock's right. really a big deal. This is before Nirvana, yeah. like a couple of year or a right, year before right. Nirvana or something. Huh. But so Crazy. anyway, <laughs> nice. we did this thing. I the record's like sounds terrible, probably because I don't know what the <laughs> hell I'm doing at this point. I'm kind of like transitioning out of one thing into another. I really yeah. don't have a lot of chops at that kind of music but um <laughs> do it anyway right, uh, it comes right. out cool there's one like really magical song on a record called pets that everybody really likes and okay. it was kind of a unusual thing nice. so, and it worked because you know an alternative you didn't have to nothing had to sound good anyway right. yet so like <laughs> still trying to get right. get good at what i was doing right, but um right. Nice. Did that, and then and then I just got a bunch of projects after that. You know, I just started right. doing. You know, spent the '90s uh, doing alternative stuff, and then near the end of the '90s, uh, I uh, I uh, did this. I was doing lots of different things, but there was one band I went to see at a club, uh, Monster Magnet. They had this yeah. band called. Um, I mean, they had that. That it was when they had that song Negasonic. The uh, mm -hmm. what was the name of the? Uh, I can't even remember the name of the record. It was the one before the one that I did. But okay. I ended up doing um, this uh, this uh, record power trip with them and the song Space Lord that was really big. Right, and, right. And nice. um, okay. and then from there, and, and I had really hadn't done anything like hard rock or anything. I was more of like you know, alternative rock and just weird stuff yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. But that was the first time I, I, I really did like a really big project. And, and and at that point, it was really early on. We had Pro Tools and things. And, right. and it was a really interesting record where we did a lot of cool stuff with different drum sets and, yeah. you know, dynamics and things and really try, stretched out. It's one of the more bigger productions that right, I've done right. nice. up to that point. So and that and then, yeah. And so that, I'm giving my long story, but that, no, it's like that's, that's cool. the... That that that's the my career arc, yeah, my yeah, background from that sure. to to that, and then from there on to other stuff. And right. so I kind of ended up doing like some guys think I'm a metal guy because I ended up doing a bunch of you know doing Slayer and yeah. Hatebreed and stuff like that. And other guys think I'm an alternative guy. Right. And other guys, <laughs> you know, think I'm a blues guy or something because of things I've done. So it's just or a rap nice. guy, you know. Yeah, so I've done exactly. all these things from different, <laughs> nice, different, nice. Uh, you know. So, so lately, have you been doing more mixing production? full track uh, pretty much uh, i mean I, i'm almost mostly doing mixing um, okay. a lot of mixing and mastering and right. um, occasional productions you know with the way things are it's like everybody's super diy a lot of times and mm. different things but but uh i do you know i do like one one big production every couple years and a bunch of small you know really fast records right and then just lots of mixing and stuff like right, that right nice awesome um well, one of the things I like to talk a lot about on the podcast is kind of how to how to inspire artists in the studio and how to get great performances yeah. and that kind yeah. of stuff. 
Yeah. Um, so when you're first kind of connecting with an artist you haven't worked with, what do you do to prepare them for the studio? There's a, uh, I, for a long time, you know, uh, one of my processes were, were to, to make a demo with them before I, if, if it's a, okay. it kind of depends on the scope of the project. Right. But my first thing to do is talk to them and, and really try to connect with them personally with their vision. I, I, I like to go down and watch, watch bands play and I see like each guy's approach to music, like okay. what, what, what kind of stuff they like to do. Like I try to see how they, you know, like what their ten musical tendencies are mm. kind of approach it. Like maybe like how you, somebody approaches coaching or something like that. Right. You know, I just want to see what everybody's strengths and weaknesses are and their personalities okay. and how they interact together. And then I want to get an idea, obviously really good, hopefully idea of a vision for what they're, what they want, you know right. what I mean, and right. and you do that, you do all the research, you know, go back and listen to their stuff. A lot of times, bands, what they think they are and what their fans think they are are different. So sometimes, you, <laughs> sometimes you run into that thing, right? And you're not like, you know, I'm trying to make a record. I don't really necessarily trying to make a record for their fans. I'm trying to make right. what they want to do, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, so so I get all that together, and then and then preparing them for the studio again, like depending on the uh, their experience level and what they're doing, I really like to do a demo sometimes and like a mm -hmm. little uh, really super fast demo of the songs in in the studio where right. we get a chance to work together, we get a chance to explore some stuff about the music hmm. and sounds prior to doing it, um, and then and then come back and 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 when when we record, it's like really smooth and it gives them a chance right. to everybody a chance to to feel each other out if if you know budget and time frame and scope permitting of course a lot of times these days people bring you their down they've already everybody every, thinks they're super diy yeah. so everybody brings they their their the demos demo. to yeah. you yeah. but um that's another way to prepare for it is is mm -hmm. to have everything really um you know if everything's super demoed out you can make uh there's there's technical things you can do to prepare and right. sometimes it's just a matter of using the demos as um, scratch tracks mm -hmm. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So, well, what's it your just what's your approach to like pre production? Like, what do you kind of work through with that? It's stuff? it's the same thing. It, it yeah. just again, it really depends on <laughs> it. All, the, they're all different, and it it depends on um, time frame, budget, scope, right. pe previous experience. But like, ideally, I like to do again. I like to uh, you know, there may be three, there may be two demos, but there may be the demos they bring and a demo mm -hmm. that I make with them off of those demos. And right. then we do it if, if we have enough time to do it that way. Right. And they're willing to do it that way. And they care about it that much. And then yeah. other, other times <laughs> it's like they have, uh, you know, I, I, I go through their demos and analyze it. We talk about it. I might have some ideas for different arrangement stuff right. and change right. some things around it, it. Everything's everyone's different. There's no one thing for me, for sure, and mm -hmm. I know there's process guys that have like their team and they yeah. run it through their machine and it's done <laughs> right, exactly the same right. way with that. I'm not like that. Like right. all my records are different. The, my I do have a process, um, mm -hmm. and I do have you know methods that I and methodology that I run it through, so I get the the same desired result every time. Right. But I try. To, it's just different, you know. It's just like it's going to be the music their experience level their background if they made a gazillion records i don't need to teach them that stuff but right. one thing i found today though it's like any and that, i'm i'm kind of aged you know i'm almost 60 now <laughs> so like you know it's like i'm i'm kind of uh, overqualified or aged out of a lot of stuff cuz the newer uh -huh. kids that come and so many people come in now it's like you got to teach them the entire music business right <laughs> they don't know anything at all right. i mean there's so much like back when i started you got hired for the gig there was there was an a and r guy yeah. a manager you had a manager mm -hmm. and the band right. and you never talked about anything because everybody already knew everything every everybody right. had already made records everybody right. knew how much you were going to get paid how long it was going to take you did you made a budget you made a schedule you did all right. this stuff but it was like everything was pre-understood you didn't have to teach everybody yes. every step <laughs> of it from the beginning right you know now it's some dad some yeah. guy's father paying for it and yeah. you got to explain the whole right you know, well, freaking that, thing everyone's, to them. everyone's independent now well so I mean, yeah like, i mean everybody and it's good there, there's nothing wrong with that well mm -hmm. there there's it's funny because when everybody became independent and you know we threw off the shackles of the oppressive right. industry uh i, I discovered something that <laughs> the that? industry was really useful <laughs> like it, <laughs> it provided a way to like to to focus in and right. at a very useful function for uh 
taking, weeding out, and and uh, you know, and honing, um, right. honing uh, careers and yeah, and, and refining. refining stuff, yeah. refining stuff. Now it's like, and my classic line is, you know, there was back then, there were a hundred bands with a million fans each. Right. Now there's a million bands with a hundred fans <laughs> each. You know, right. that's the di- because there's no no process yeah. to get to those hundred yeah. really good bands. You know, right, right. And um, well, it's a lot about just yeah. understanding the business too. Like you said, yeah. like everyone has to do it themselves. So yeah, you just, so they're just feeling you know. it out. And and some yeah. wonderful things happen when you make you know bump into things and a crazy noise comes yeah. out. You're like, oh, it's great. It never would have happened if I would have right. known what I was doing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but but most of the time. Right. It's kind of <laughs> awkward oh, and painful and confusing. So, yeah, so totally. there's a lot of that, you know, that keeps me. But that, I mean, I've kind of got off topic. But you asked me about, you know, preparing. It's like each mm. one's different. You know, yeah. it's gonna be. And some guys need a lot of preparation and a lot of work on their stuff. And for those ones, don't call me. You know, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, but uh, but in some guys, you know, it's all dialed in. Like you know, the, and and it's relatively easy. Right. Right. But there's other issues usually, you know, with right. those kind of people. Right. So, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I just want to take a quick break and tell you about my free guide, The Art Method, the Advanced Recording Toolkit. In it, I share the details of how you can get pro studio results from your home studio. I've believed for a long time that it's the cooking, not the kitchen. If you can learn some of the advanced methods for getting great results in the studio, you can do it in any studio. I skip the basics and dive into the more nuanced info you need to level up the quality of your home studio recordings. Check it out now at brennandecora.com slash art. And now, back to the show. And how do you kind of set up the studio as a pre as a creative playground in a sense there's it just it really it depends i mean it goes you know back in the day it was awesome you know like i had there i've done every possible thing you could do we had, right. i had a golf net over over at uh at sound <laughs> city we had a dr- driving net we we, we, oh, we, we were picking full swings at, <laughs> at golf balls into nice, a net nice. in, in the uh, in the live room so right. i've done every possible thing you can do for fun in the studio if, mm. if we have the money and the and the time right. or but uh <laughs> but as far as uh also just you know uh yes you know vi- vibe out the place make it really nice uh Turn it into a playground, a musical p- playground with mm-hmm. you know. A good, it just yeah, it all depends on the artist. The artist is really interested in pedals. Right. I had a zillion pedals back then, like right, and, right. and uh, a million amps and stuff like that, yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. Today, it's just it's kind of all changed to like you know it's all in a box, some digital right. box, some right. place. So a lot of that <laughs> fun has, uh, you know, some of that stuff has gone away. I mean, you know, it's still like it's still personal. You know, it's just connecting with the artist. Sometimes now it's just like it's like where you're sitting right now. They come over and we just talk for right. an hour and a half before they do vocals about right, whatever's right. going on. Right. And I, just I mean, get, that's part of it for me. Yeah, and, yeah, to get comfortable and just I don't even think about it. It's not even I'm not even doing it on. It's just, it's just <laughs> unfortunately with me that's what happens. Right. You can't get. It. I'm sure the guy wanted to get in there 45 minutes. <laughs> earlier but we started talking um but no you know that it's it's that's pretty much in these days it's just that it's just like just you know obviously i didn't get in this to not have fun i mean i would have done something else i would have done yeah i'd have been an actuary for an insurance company or some (laughs) shit if i didn't want to have fun right exactly uh what's a common misconception about the music production process that you want to that it's fun no (laughs) no uh common mis conception about the music um i mean well interesting uh i think it really depends on what uh generation you're talking about i mean okay music has changed so much uh because of technology from when i started to to now right. so there were miscon different misconceptions then than there are now mm-hmm. um i mean uh one of them is is that you can uh you know that you can truly fix everything and make everything. Uh, you know, fix your. Yeah, you know, one one of the right. biggest things about music now is there's so many aids to uh, repair, fix, and edit things that people mm-hmm. think that everything will be um, can be done later on. Right. Um, right. And you get into these weird uh, scenarios. I've always like so. 
originally my job was to show up and and record. Okay, how do, how does the, there's this the, the can gets kicked down the road? Put it put it this yes. way. It's like yes. So <laughs> the producer used to show up. The band had been playing in a garage and they had songs. And the producer would show up and record the songs. Um, mm. He'd maybe work on the arrangements. Some producers are songwriting producers, and they right, uh, they'd right. be song doctors, this and that. But it's in some some shape or form, the producer recorded it. Mm. He handed it off to the mixer. The mixer mixed it. He handed it off to the mastering guy, and the mastering yeah. guy mastered it. Right. Now the producer hands a bunch of like uh, stems, and you know, as as a mixer, I get this the shit where it's like, okay, can you put these terrible sounding drums? You got to put some samples on them, right. some DI tracks. <laughs> I've got to choose the guitar sounds and the bass sounds, yeah. and do all the stuff. <laughs> and so I do that, and then I make stems and send the stems to the mastering guy, and he actually blends the stems <laughs> right. and does the bell. Like nobody does their job, right. their actual job, because they don't want to commit to anything. Yeah, so the exactly. the misconception is is that you that you shouldn't commit to anything. Right. Um, right. In the modern era, where it's like, I love commitment. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I love making decisions so that then my next decision is based off of the previous decision right. and not like right. leaving everything to the end. And and I've learned some great things from young kids that make crazy commitments. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like everything I do in the, in the digital world, I'm trying to create, recreate the analog world that I grew up on right. in the 80s. I'm trying to yeah. build this console and do everything with sends and all this crazy mm -hmm. They just fucking... Open up Audio Suite and slap some reverb right, right on the track. <laughs> right. make, they make, and and, it, and in a way, they don't have to commit. They can undo it or they can keep another thing. But like, right. they'll do some amazing things with the tools because mm -hmm. they don't have the background, the, the idea of like they'll use a compressor or something in a totally bizarre way and get right, some great right. effects um, right. that I would never get. So there's stuff to be learned from you know people not knowing stuff exactly. and not having that those kind of exactly. things too. But but yeah, but commitment. Um, the, 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 the lack of the, the, the idea that technology makes it so you never have to make a, right, a final right. decision on yeah. anything. Well, is, that is and, a, you know, Pro Tools now, you can run well, you still can. Like, yeah, 2,000 you, tracks or something yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, you can it's have like, everything melodyned and tuned yeah. and never even, never even commit any, you don't have right. to commit anything. Yeah, you know, you just exactly. have it all running. And, uh, and it's great, you know, yeah. um, but I prefer, I think in, in art, it's good to good to have a yeah. <laughs> make a couple decisions <laughs> right and, and, and not, stick to them and then the and finish end. yeah and be able to finish some stuff and, <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly um, how do you maintain a balance between artistic in integrity and commercial success um, I don't know man uh, like I try to do stuff that I that I like okay. If it's commercially successful, that's awesome, and I and mm. I I have a pretty good idea of, of what you know goes into making something a commercial success. Sadly, these days, like if, for me personally, if mm. like something, if a million people like it, I'm probably not, not going to like it that much <laughs> anymore. But but right. I know what it what does it. But um, for me, the goal is to make something that I'm going to love ten years from now. Right. And that the artist is going to love 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Something that's got some timeless uh, quality or effect to right. it that works. Now, you know, it, it can't, all, you know, everything is done when it's done and mm -hmm. is a document of that point in time for the artist and what's going on, right. you know, culturally and what's going on, um, you know, and musically with taste and stuff exactly. and the genres and yeah. all this kind of stuff. But ideally... If you make some, you can make something great in any genre that like kind of somewhat stands the test of time. That you can throw it up. Right. Ten, you know, it's not gonna. You're not gonna cringe when you put it on um, ten years yeah. later. <laughs> so that's that's the artistic goal for me most of the time, mm -hmm. personally. Um, and then the other one is just to get the artist vision. You know, like like right. the greatest thing I could ever be told is like I loved this record, man. I loved working with you, and I love the way this thing came right. out. Right. I'm super proud of it. That's, and then and then the commercial thing. It's like, I I look at it like. In, so it's a success to be doing this for a living. It's a success to get the gig. <laughs> then it's a success to actually, uh, um, you know, get you get chosen for the gig. Mm -hmm. Then you you get to record it. Then it's a success if it if you finish recording it. Then it's a success if it comes out. Right. And then if it gets on the radio, it's amazing. And then if it sells, it's incredible. But right. it's like try to look at it like every part you know mm, everything every is a win because you know just just staying <laughs> on the horse long enough to get there but right. eventually you get a few that like right. that uh 
that do well and yeah. and um, you know it, it kind of like you just it's just just hanging around long enough and mm -hmm. and doing ones and you know it's like some of the guys that are really good at this just to pick winners you know they pick, pick bands that have already got fans and right, like it's right. kind of a, you know you get two records land on your desk it's like this one these guys have like you know uh seven top 10 hits and four right. like platinum records and this is like a brand new band it's yeah. like this is the one you know that's gonna, gonna be easier right. that, you know it's gonna be commercially successful yeah. do something that's commercially successful right exactly. you know it's like i'm exactly. just uh you know right <laughs> so what is the what's the most rewarding aspect of being an engineer do you think um yeah i i think just uh i the most rewarding thing for me is uh do it you know getting a chance to work on something that i really like and, and making something sound super good and mm -hmm. and and just just work like a really really long day of, of working in a really really nice studio right. with killer gear uh, and recording really good musicians that, right. that's just rewarding to me it's like i yeah. love being around super talented people right um brilliant people who like like uh just you know blow my mind with their talent that that's the most rewarding thing mm -hmm. whether it's they're great songwriters or great performers um you know somebody's got like really i, I want to be the worst guy in the room the greatest <laughs> thing about doing this is and it's been this way many times it's like i get hired and everybody listens to me and the, I, I know that i'm absolutely the least talented guy <laughs> in the thing that's when i'm the happiest when i'm the most talented guy in the room right. it's i'm miserable when i have the best right. ears of everybody in the room i'm miserable that's when true. i know uh you know I have, I have a better idea of where the song should go than the, right. than the person that's doing it, it sucks. <laughs> you know, it's like I want to be blown away by people right. who are great, um, exactly. and that's that's rewarding. Nice, yeah. nice. Uh, when it comes to mixing, what do you think is one underrated skill or trait for that's vital for a good mixer? Um, just musicality and really, obviously, you know, you say good ears, but like musical ears, mm -hmm. you know, really, really understanding um, music. Right. Uh, and I mean, by music, I mean, like, you know, being able to, knowing stuff about, you know, key right. and, and having really, really good timing, really good pitch, all the stuff that mm -hmm. would go into being a great musician right. makes a great mixer to me, uh, yeah. ma really makes a, a great mixer. I mean, all the techniques and all that stuff, it's great. Everybody can do that. Everybody right. can, um, right. especially these days with, with all the tools and stuff. Mm. But what, what really puts you over the edge is when you have a really great musical ear right right and and a feel for the song and dynamics and stuff like that absolutely nice and how do you how do you decide when a mix is finally finished um when the art when, <laughs> when i get paid like when they send the uh, no uh um that too though i i mean that's kind of like that's the gig is fin is like making it sound finished. That's what right. mixing is. <laughs> so um, I, it's a process. I, I get what I do is I get it to a certain point where where I think mm. it's sounding killer. I send it to the artist. I love to get a ton of feedback. I mean, that's how I've right. become a great mixer here. I think I'm a great mixer. I don't know. I'm a good mixer. <laughs> here is um, is that is that process of getting tons of feedback. Because now I do stuff right. and I I get less and less comments because they're all. I've I'm responding to the 10 million comments I've already gotten so right, it's like right. I'm usually super dialed in you know it doesn't always work that way it's funny you'll do like four records that come out great and everybody's super happy mm. and then that fifth one they'll be like what the fuck is this you're, this is terrible <laughs> and they just hear it totally different than right, you said right. and you're like on a roll and you're doing everything and then all of a sudden this one does not fit the, yep. so that can happen yep. but um, as far as finishing yeah it's just it's just knowing it's just getting uh, that the, those comments I, I let the artist tell me when it's finished and then right. I usually do a couple last <laughs> things at the very end when I'm you know putting it down <laughs> and stuff but it, it's it's a process usually of, of, of getting it to that 75 85 percent there grinding right. out that 15 percent with with everybody you know mm. going through that whole consensus thing that drives us all crazy where sometimes records get ruined but 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 yeah, uh, it, yeah. it can't they can but <laughs> you going through that process and then and yeah and then you know it's kind of it's i i'm not the one that usually makes that decision that it's right. done 
Well, you know I, I mean, mean I, I guess. Like, I mean, I, I know what, it, what, what I, if your <laughs> answer is, you're, I know there's a couple different <laughs> ways that that question can be taken. It's like, when do I know it's at that, at that point where I can hand it, I can play exactly, it for them. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's. That's what I mean. That, that, yeah, that, that's. <laughs> okay, so for me, if I'm doing a full album, I'll, I'll take the whole album and I'll put it up in a session and listen to all the songs together and hear how they're interacting with right. each other. Because I learned so much from working on multiple songs. Like I'll learn okay. the solution to something six songs in and I'll go back and right, right. mess around with it. And so huh. I, I listen to the whole thing together and I, I feel how it's going and A-B it to a couple things, make sure I like you know right. the, the levels, maybe a few of their old records, some other records, similar mm -hmm. things in the genre. And when it's feeling right there, then I can send it off to them and stuff. Right. And then, you know, you're, you're always going to get some stuff. Sometimes you're really close, and then sometimes you're like, oh, yeah. you got to do, you know, I was hearing something totally different with this or that, and then right, right. just do that. But, yeah, so that's the that's usually my process before I'm comfortable sending right, it off. Right, right. And then how do you, I mean, often when I'm mixing, I, you know, it's always important to kind of, figure out their vision and their yeah. their direction. How do you how do you get that out of people? Well, there's a couple depending on the project. See, I like to Okay, so I'm mixing from the moment and this is true. I, I've heard people say this and mm -hmm. it's true. It's like I'm mixing from the moment I set the first kick drum mic up. Right. And with the new with the way the technology is now, you can rough mix really really yeah. really uh like one thing i'll do is i'll do the drums mm -hmm. then i'll take it back here and i'll make a drum stem in my dr mix template that's like so the right. drums sound okay. 80 90 percent mixed okay nice. then i'll make a bass stem that sounds 80 90 percent mixed right. then i'll track all the guitars to that and so i'm always okay. making these roughs that sound really really right, pretty right. slamming and fun to listen to they're, mm -hmm. they're you know they're not perfectly balanced and there's things coming in and right. out sometimes they're real wacky but they they're <laughs> They're hi-fi, and also when, you're, when I'm tracking my tones now, I'm tracking my tones into mixed stuff, so like right, the right. everything's really st um, shapes up. So huh. I mix as I go along. So during that process, you're A, B, and everything out. You know, you're trying out right. vocal sounds, and the guy's like, I like this vocal sound. Yeah. Okay, so now I know the vocal sound to go for for this song. Or yeah. the demo has clues. So right. I'm listening to the demos for clues. I'm listening to feedback from my roughs that I'm making the whole time that mm. are pretty honed in using my mix templates and stuff right. and that gets me really really close to you know i'm making sure i know what the artist likes mm -hmm. um you know if he has comments about the way the drums sound right, like certain right. things the way things are eq'd frequencies i'm i'm listening to everything everything everybody's saying the whole time right. and kind of logging that in the back of my brain and making adjustments and hopefully i'm getting comments like and these roughs are slamming mm -hmm. which happens a lot and then i know like okay i know what they like Mm -hmm. I know kind of what the vocal sounds are going to be in this thing, so now I just got to polish this thing up. Right. I'll tear it all down again and come back, but yeah. like, but I have a really good idea of okay, this band likes loud guitars. This band likes right, right. this loud, that loud. This band likes this kind of stuff, you know. And, so, and what about stuff that you only get hired to mix? Um, that you're not doing. Yeah, well, recording. that's tr that's trickier. But th in that case, the, um, there's been a lot of different ways that that happens um mm -hmm. sometimes i'll go back and listen to their other stuff okay you get a lot of these like hey we, we're doing a shootout you know uh mm -hmm. one of the coolest stories this is I'll, I'll, real quick there's a there's yeah. this band called behemoth uh -huh. i did a couple of, i mixed a couple of their records okay um guy's fucking awesome nurgle he first he was trying me out was trying a bunch of guys out and he sent me a mix uh when they were doing this band this record right. called the satanist i sent him back a test mix he was, was totally underwhelmed it was just like a shit you know i didn't i don't know <laughs> what to do when i get these shootouts it's like i just kind of just put up put it up run it through my stuff kind of make it sound cool send it to him right he's like ah you know it's, it's really not you know yeah I'm like, that's cool he's like you know I, I really want you know but but instead of just blowing me off he's like you know I wanted something like really crazy, like you know, like God hates us all. It's got to be like metaphysical, or crazy. I was like, right. okay, well, let me take another crack and I'll send it to you. So I just fucking, I tore. I didn't do anything that I normally do, and I just gunned everything, and it's like everything's all distorted, <laughs> right. and like digital crackle on everything, just yeah. terrible. But I was trying. I was just trying to be really extreme and trying to right. do. I was thinking, you know, God hates us all. I remember. Those mixes, which I didn't even end up, I, my mixes were too crazy in that record. Um, <laughs> I think Sean Bevan mixed it, but he kind of okay. copied a lot of the stuff I did, you huh. know, all, all, all my notes. But my my right. mix was like crazy on that one. But um, he loved it. Then he was mm -hmm. like, "This is perfect." And so I spent the whole time. <laughs> I spent like the next 
three months uh, doing comments with them and honing in on it and figuring right. out ways to undistort, get everything <laughs> that I'd done not, it was so not technically crazy. awful. <laughs> yeah. I could never, you know, hand that in to anybody Jeez. to master and shit. So I spent the whole time trying to get everything right, undistorted right. and back awesome. in whack. But yeah, but, but so yeah, you know, in that case, Again, you just gotta, you just gotta, you know, if if somebody's willing to work with you, that's why they, when they do these stupid shootouts and all these kind of yeah. things, it's like, there's no way to know. You're just guessing, and and sometimes mm-hmm. they'll choose the wrong band that way too. It's it's really a bad way to do it. Right. You got to choose a couple of guys, and you actually got to have a a dial an open dialogue and be able to go back and forth right. a little bit. Right. And then to do that, you really got to want to do it because they're, they're expecting to do that shit for free too. So it's kind of right, like a right. lot of work. So <laughs> I, I, I never. I mean, everybody wants the taste test now and all this yeah. stuff. But <laughs> Makes it I difficult. Makes it's it hard. Difficult. It's hard, but yeah. I mean, I don't know. So the, that the answer to your question is it's it's different, but it's got to mm-hmm. be communication and research. I guess right, are the right. two things for yeah. sure. For sure. And is there some um, current or recent projects that you can talk about that you want to? Um, current and recent projects. Well, I'm doing two things right now. I'm doing uh, a see the record. I've done three records with, or this would be my third record with them. Mm-hmm. I think it's the best one. The last one had like I think four number ones on okay. on nice. an active rock, and the one before that had like one number one and one like top five. And they, and, they, and then they 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 screwed up because they really had a better song on there that they could have had. Yeah. But the guy's a great songwriter for that style. It's like kind of like right. people love it in the Midwest and stuff. Really, nice. really good record um, that I just got done doing. I just came back from Blackbird and uh, nice. it sounds really cool. So had a lot of fun with that. And then I'm doing this other guy who I love. Um, his name is Jason Charles Miller. And it's like, it's kind of like Southern rock. It's rock, okay. but with a definitely like a Southern and, and certain country overtones to it. And definitely, um, uh, a southern rock vibe and he's got this really cool low voice and uh and uh you know kenny arnoff played drums on it sounds the drums fucking sound awesome the whole thing nice. sounds killer nice. um and i really like his projects uh we'd actually started that the, the weird thing is is this is really strange but the last see the record i did right before the pandemic and the first half of this record with jason i did right before the pandemic mm-hmm. and somehow they both have come back to me now we're I'm doing another C the record. I'm finishing that record at the same, <laughs> same time. Nice. And so those are the two nice. things I'm working on right now that are really cool. good. So. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I like to wrap up each yeah. podcast with the same kind of set of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is, who is your most influential teacher? And it, it, it definitely can be a few if you want. Okay, well, the, probably uh, Andrew Berliner. Um, okay. A guy named Larry Getz, uh, who you might he he worked at Paramount. Mm-hmm. Andrew Berliner, who built uh, Crystal, um, and uh, Chris Rakestraw. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Rakestraw. Uh, nice. Um, who else? Uh, guys that I admire and I've learned little, picked up little things from along the way, or mm-hmm. like guys like Joe Barisi. I love. I think yeah. he's a great. Um, and and I got I can't I, I'm I'm probably spacing out right now. I've learned from a lot of different guys. Right. Um, but way back in the day, uh, I learned a lot from watching Tom Lord LG mix. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. And I learned a lot of stuff about mixing from him. Um, okay. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, what is your favorite reference track? If you have to go to a new studio, learn the room, what do you put on? Oh man, let me think. Um, I've done different ones at different times. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 re- it really depends on the type of band I'm doing. Right. And a lot of times I just listen to the, their things and I'll, or I'll listen to some uh, old stuff that I've done because I'm really familiar with it. Right, right. God, I don't know. I, yeah. I can't even I can't even <laughs> answer that question right now. I mean, I don't I don't um, like I don't put up like back in black or any shit yeah, like that yeah. anymore. Like you know. Well, like, I've also found but, a lot of a lot of guys like work in their own spot so much they yeah. don't even do that so we don't I barely that. even do that anymore but yeah. I, I i generally put up some something that i've worked on recently so right. i don't have like a favorite one okay. but it'll be something that i'm familiar with how it sounds here right so i can right. hear what what the thing's doing exactly. you know what exactly. the room's doing my i don't have a good enough memory like for, <laughs> i know exactly how uh, you know uh, pyromania sounds in every <laughs> right. every uh, you know right, this right. mutt lang record sounds in every room you know? exactly nice uh, last question: What would be one tidbit you have for an upcoming engineer? Um, last uh, okay tidbit. Uh, 
yeah, man, j just try try to stay uh, try try to uh, to stay uh, approach everything uh, with uh, enthusiasm and like chi a childlike. Mm -hmm. uh, try to make every time you go in like the very first time in some way. Right. Like uh, it's the key, don't, don't get too locked into um, a process. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, try to uh, approach everything, um, you know, look for a, you know, try to have a good accident every time or a find, right, find something, right. have something. I mean, if that, that should be the goal, the, yeah. the, the, to have a new experience every time mm -hmm. you record, some kind of new experience right. every time you record. It's really difficult yeah. <laughs> as, you, as, you, as you go on, but yeah. that's the best you know that, yeah. that, that's that's the goal you know in mm -hmm. the beginning it's kind of the opposite you know you right, want to develop right. a process and do that right, stuff of course but um huh. yeah i mean that that that's my nice. you know and long term uh thing i'd say is right, yeah, right. stay open minded awesome all right so thanks so much i really appreciate it all right thank you it's great to have you awesome cool thanks for joining in today on pro audio profiles make sure to hit subscribe and i'll see you next week